Добрый день, меня зовут Ян Кравченко. В принципе, я очень извиняюсь, что приходится делать презентацию таким образом. Я очень надеялся там быть лично. Но из-за того, что программист – это очень дорогая вещь на всей Украине, моя компания так и не смогла еще найти команду, поэтому приходится давать вам эту информацию таким образом. Заранее извиняюсь, большинство этой презентации будет на английском языке. На этом две причины. Основная, конечно, то, что мне более сложно выражаться на русском языке, на технические темы. Но также, откровенно говоря, весь OWASP SAM пока что только на английском языке. Поэтому, в принципе, чтобы им пользоваться, все равно знание английского языка необходимо. Um, если у вас есть какие-то вопросы, можно их задавать на любом языке, uh, но также uh, я бы очень попросил, чтобы, uh, так как я вас, в принципе, очень плохо слышу, uh, может быть, попросить кого-то взять микрофон и остановить меня, если, если есть у кого-то кого вопросы. Um, я занимаюсь с ОВАСП уже много лет, и примерно 5-6 лет я уже я волонтер на проекте SAM. SAM — это Software Assurance and Maturity Model. И этим летом мы продолжаем, и мы уже последний год, я бы сказал, работаем довольно концентрированно на том, чтобы вып выпустить новую версию SAM, которая более бы сопутствовала более прогрессивным языкам программирования. И сегодня я хочу, а, ну, во-первых, дать вам а, как-то небольшую историю, на которой обоснованы наши изменения для модели, и также поговорить про новую модель и дать вам знать, каким образом все могут а, смотреть за прогрессом этой разработки и в какой-то мере даже нам помогать с этим. So, on the agenda today, um, first, I would like to discuss why we need OWASP. Why is it necessary? Um, talk a little bit about how the programming languages and methodologies have evolved um, over the time. Now, I have been in this industry for about 20 years. Um, for a lot of people who are newer to this industry, it might be beneficial to understand why we have the technology debt and some of the legacy nightmares that we do today. Um, and of course, most of my focus will be to talk about OWASP SAM 2.0. So why OWASP SAM? Why is it necessary? Um, why can't we just know what to do? Um, The truth is that in the information security industry as, as a profession, application security expertise are very rare. Application expertise are very rare. Most security people of any experience typically come from the background of servers and networks. And while for a while that was okay, right now it's creating a lot of frustration for developers because they want to embrace DevOps, they want to do some of the more interesting projects, they want to use some of the cutting edge tools. Um, and to be frank, a lot of old school security people simply don't understand how that works. The other reason why SAM is important is SAM is a maturity model. And trying to plug security holes is not a great combination. It's not something that's going to win in a long time. Um, and a lot of the reasons why SAM is necessary is because we're not looking at SAM as an answer to one software being developed. We're looking at SAM as guiding principles for large organizations that have anywhere from a couple of applications being developed to thousands. SAM also allows companies to create roadmaps. So if as a developer or as an app security professional, you're frustrated with, well, why can't we do those things that we've been asking for for a long time? Uh, sometimes the simple answer is because no one's planned for you to get them. And for a lot of large organizations, making quick decisions about acquiring tools or technology are almost impossible. And of course, SAM doesn't represent views of any one person or any one company. Um, for example, our core group of people on the software assurance and maturity model is comprised of two people from Belgium, one person from Germany, one person from England, one person from New Zealand, and two people from the United States. So it really is a very global effort that's representative of not only one country or one individual's vision, um, but it really does represent more of a global, community-driven um, 
community-driven effort in describing what would mature software development look like. So as I mentioned before, it's a maturity model. Um, it is not intended to tell you how secure your software is. It's not intended to tell you if you have to do all of the things the maturity model describes. It simply says, here are all the things you can do. Based on what it is you're doing, here is a maturity score that you can achieve. Now, ultimately, it then is up to you to decide how secure or how mature your development environment needs to be. So if you're creating a marketing application that rotates banners, well, you might not need very much. Or adversely, if you're working in a bank and you're writing a software that moves money around, well, then you probably want a higher level of maturity for your application. And so that approach helps us remove some of the judgment from the framework. And that's why the framework is not written in a way as to say you have to do all of those things, but it's really more of a catalog of activities that you can choose from. OpenSAM was initially released in 2009. And ironically, back then, uh, SAM was a product of a single individual who worked at Fortify Security. Uh, his name is Pavir Chandra, and he literally went into the mountains for two weeks and came back with a complete 1.0 open SAM framework written out. And as you can see from the timeline between 2009 and 2016, not much has changed. Now, do you think technology has changed a little bit since 2009 versus 2016? Of course it has. Um, but the framework sort of remains stale. And so for that reason, in 2016, um, one of the uh, pretty great community leaders of OWASP, uh, uh, Siba, decided that he is going to take it on and he's going to update it. So that's when we formed our core group with the mandate of actually updating OpenSAM to help better support present day development. In 2017, we released a minor update where we changed the scoring model a little bit. In truth, we didn't really change the scoring model. Everyone was already, no one was really used. The original model focused on your maturity rating was one or one plus or two or two plus. People were not really using that anymore. They were always using a decimal. So essentially in 2017, we kind of made it official. But the big focus for us and what we're all working on is the SAM 2.0. Um, and we call it the DevOps release. And we're actually calling it the DevOps release for multiple reasons. Um, not only because we're trying to get SAM to better support methodologies like DevOps, but also because the way we're going about updating and releasing that model is also changing and we're borrowing from DevOps uh, to make the process more efficient, which I'll show you in a little bit. So I don't know what the level of familiarity is with you uh, with uh, OWASP SEM 1.5, um, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to at least show you what the current older model looks like. And you can see that we have governance, we have construction, we have verification, and we have deployment. And so you kind of have this general flow um, starting from determining how the software should be written and you know some of the governance things that nobody likes. Well, nobody except for me likes. Uh, then you get construction, which is how the software is actually being built. Um, verification is probably the most mature aspect of app security because this is what most people have figured out to do. This is what most companies have figured out. Well, we don't know how you wrote the software. We can't talk to you because we don't understand software development, but we know how to hire a pen tester who will tell us if you have problems in your code. We can't tell you why you have those problems. We can't tell you how to fix them, but we can tell you if they're there. Um, and of course, the world of deployment, um, which again, if you think back to 2009, um, you know, does anybody remember what a server looks like? Uh, moving to 2018, um, where absolutely everything is basically virtualized nowadays. Um, so the old model worked, but you can kind of see that the old model really had that waterfall flavor to it. It really had these very solid stages um, that an application would go through um, in terms of a software development. 
So, unfortunately, things did not stay still. And things kept on changing and leading the charge were programming languages. So, once I was asked in the presentation, why do we need so many programming languages? Um, unfortunately, this question works much better when I'm standing in front of you in person and I can see your responses, but can you guys all collectively agree on the same text editor? Any, any ideas? Is there one text editor that'll work for absolutely everyone? Now, text editors are easy. And you will, and, and I have not found two developers who use the same one yet. So if we can't all agree on the same text editor, how could we all agree on the same programming language? It literally becomes mission impossible. So from the programming language standpoint, um, it seems that, I mean, first of all, I will be the first to say we have too many. We have too many frameworks, we have too many programming languages, and it seems like we keep coming out with new ones and more and more and more every day. The way that programming languages work also has changed somewhat. Now, the more traditional software development language was compiled, where you write the code and it gets compiled into an object, or and then that, that's what gets executed. Interpreted languages are something where you write the set of instructions and they're being interpreted on the fly. Now, I know there are Java developers in the room. Guys, please exhale. I know that Java is a hybrid. I know it's kind of both. So, but. For the simplicity of explaining how this works, um, let's at least focus on the two types of programming languages, compiled and interpreted, because it is an important part of the evolution. Compiled languages were historically very hard to learn. Um, I still remember the pains of having to take C and C++ in college. I mean, my first programming language was assembly. Uh, they were hard to learn. They were very hard to master, and typically, if you found a C developer with five years of experience, you knew that that person had some substance because to survive in that world for five years, you needed some chops. Um, from the interpreted standpoint, these languages are easy to learn. Of course, it all started with the infamous basic, but ultimately, right now, your interpreted languages, if you have a Macintosh, you have Python preloaded. Um, interpreted languages are becoming increasingly easy to learn. And Again, here, I would argue that it's become too easy to write software. In fact, I have irrefutable proof that people who should have no business writing software are able to write software. And that irrefutable proof is the fact that I've written software. And I'm the last person you should ever hire to do that. Compiled languages typically require some training. Interpreted. If you know how to get to Google, you will typically figure things out. Um, which is interesting because right now, having interviewed several developers, you can definitely tell the difference between those who actually re received some training and have some experience versus those who learned how to write software by Googling. Compiled languages are typically faster because they're compiled into machine code and so they're generally going to be executed in a much more efficient manner. Interpreted languages are generally slower because a lot of that interpretation happens in real time. However, to compensate for that, we have figured out how to do horizontal scaling. So if we can't make something run fast enough, we will just add more systems to handle the workload. Also, and this is a very important piece, uh, compiled languages, you still have a concept of a standalone executable, a binary you can download and execute. With interpreted languages, you have dependencies galore, and these dependencies only start with the interpreter, and they go way after reservations when it comes to add-ons or modules. And speaking of which, for compiled languages, a lot of these add-ons and modules or components, they were all commercially developed, so there was definitely a lot more of a concept of knowing what you're getting. Open source dependencies, unfortunately, are all over the place. There are some that are commercially developed and they're excellent, and there are others that are amateur written. Now, with interpreted language modules specifically, first of all, you have to remember that open source licensing isn't all the same across the board. For example, if you're using a GPL licensed open source module, it means that <clears throat> should you make any changes or any improvements to that module, you're legally required to publish those back to the open source community. 
Now, of course, as citizens of the open source community, all of us are in favor of that. But I'm guessing if you talk to your employer or your client, um, they might feel otherwise. Um, in fact, there have been fairly significant lawsuits where VMware and Google were sued uh, because they used GPL kernel components that then they made massive improvements on to release their own brand of operating system. And they were then sued by the open source community saying, hey, you've made improvements to the GPL kernel. You now have to publish them back. Do you think VMware would get hurt at all if they had to actually reveal the source code of their ESX hosts and how they're actually doing all of those operating systems? Probably. Um, a lot of these applications, a lot of these modules are developed by enterprises and they are developed by professional developers, but a lot of them are developed by amateurs, just by somebody playing around who's been programming for maybe three months, who found a module that does kind of what they wanted, but not really. So they made some changes and pushed them back. For that reason, there's a wide range of quality controls. Um, I believe Google uh, sampled a large number of open source projects and found thousands of problems, both technical as well as security wise. And in fact, the problem has become so massive that there is now a concept of software supply chain that a lot of architects are becoming aware on because hackers have already figured out that compromising a module and then getting a developer to incorporate that module into a code is an excellent threat vector. So if I would like to hack into a software you're writing, maybe I don't need to actually break into your software, which requires a lot of access and a lot of other things. Maybe I can simply borrow from the techniques of phishing and create a module name that may be one letter off from a very popular module I can perhaps clone that entire um, GitHub and then start emailing developers within a single company or a single project saying, hey, check out this module and wait until somebody actually incorporates it into their software. If you don't have a robust mechanism by which you're actually scanning these third-party modules for security vulnerabilities or backdoors, there's an excellent chance that you won't catch it. And just how many modules do we need? Um, now, I I just, this is for my own personal amusement, but since I started doing this talk, I did find a few people who also watch this. There's a great website called modulecounts.com. And it's very revealing. So look at one of the original, one of the first um, interpreted languages. So Perl. It was first released in 1987 and to date, we have under 40,000 modules. Now, seems like a big number, but it's been around for a long time. Now, compare that for a second with Node that, first of all, didn't exist before 2009. So by programming language standards, it's a baby. And there's already over 660,000 modules and new ones being added at, and at an average growth rate of about 570 per day. That's every single day. So when you start to look at so many different modules being developed and so much being piped into the marketplace, you can see how these modules are becoming a problem. And you can also see how if a malicious hacker wanted to start compromising applications, they can literally just start putting backdoors into various open source developments, hoping that no one's going to catch that and hoping that it'll just get pulled in by someone. Um, but this does represent a very important problem that certainly never existed when the original SAM was written. As if that's not enough, our definition of computing architecture has also changed quite a bit. Now, from I, I recently completed a stint where I was a chief information security officer for a data center company that specialized in private clouds, so kind of a small Azure or AWS competitor. Um, I can tell you that, I mean, server rooms have changed. I, 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 in my entire stint within that company, and we had nine data centers around the world, I don't think I've ever seen a server that I actually recognized. 
you have computing blades and you have storage and somewhere in there you use software to find networking to connect them together but as if virtual machines aren't not enough we also started talking about docker we started putting things together in more of an orchestrated way with kubernetes and docker swarm and everything is cloud driven so even the concept of architecture has changed which clearly sam didn't keep pace with Infrastructure as code added a very interesting complexity to this concept in the sense that just the same as infrastructure people are not, they don't understand software development. I'm sorry to say a lot of programmers don't understand infrastructure, but yet increasingly developers are the ones that are creating infrastructure through configuration files, through builds, through software defined networking requirements. Um, you're also increasingly seeing developers take a more and more uh, presence in using some of the large-scale configuration management tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, SaltStack. So clearly, you have almost a swap in roles happening, where you have developers building infrastructure, and you have infrastructure people who are now expected to understand developers. And finally, just as you get your hands around that one, you also wake up to realize that thanks to microservices architecture, you can actually have a single application that will take advantage of five or six different programming languages or frameworks. And you're able to build your microservices based on individual needs using the database and the programming language that's best suited for whichever task you're writing. And very often, you also have various microservices built and maintained by separate teams, where you have one application that is really a combination of maybe 20 applications all working together, which creates not only complexities in terms of overall application management, but certainly for testing purposes and making sure that whenever you change something within one microservice or UI, it doesn't affect everything. And evolution of methodologies also, of course, changed. Now, for those in the room who have some years of experience in this industry, um, you know, this classic waterfall model almost brings tears of nostalgia to my eyes. I mean, things used to be so simple. You harass developers about requirements. They go, they build the application. After they're done building it, as a security person, I get my testing time. I get to look at that application, I get to bless it, and I get to say, okay, it's good to go, and only after that will somebody actually deploy it and move it through the maintenance phases. Now, while this waterfall methodology is still around because there's a lot of legacy applications that simply can't move away from it, um, clearly this method isn't what most people are trying to use today. So then we switched to Agile. Now, in the beginning, Agile was really just a way for developers to say, we're not going to document things anymore. But Agile cut up. And so now Agile is a formal methodology with lots of documentation involved. And so what you're doing is you're, you're basically developing your software with multiple iterations where you're saying, well, here's my idea. Well, let's design it, let's code it, let's test it. And you go through these multiple cycles. And then when you've finally gone through enough of them, you say, okay, fine, now we can deploy it. Now we actually have enough so we can release. This certainly sped up the deployment process um, because if waterfall model, you know, you're talking about six to nine months between releases, with Agile, you could release a lot more frequently. But even that wasn't as fast as we could go. And today, what we have is we have more of your DevOps model where most applications under, I guess, whatever DevOps means to you, uh, but in the classical interpretation of DevOps, you're in a constant cycle of going from an idea to design, to code, to test, to build, to deploy. And this never-ending loop um, is making that some organizations are publishing code as frequently as hourly, or at least that's the infamous Netflix story. Uh, but certainly you can see that a lot of organizations that are leveraging DevOps are in fact publishing code daily or weekly. And I would say daily and weekly would probably be a lot more um, consistent with what I've seen in the industry, not just uh, you know hourly, I think, except for Netflix, no one does. So you have three different methodologies here. 
so how can we create a single maturity model that provides guidance for these three very different models? Well, how different are they really? Think about it. So with each one, we have design. Under Waterfall and Agile, you generally will go through design once per release. With DevOps, you do things in much smaller increments. You have to write code at some point. <clears throat> so again, under Waterfall, you kind of have one time period where everyone writes code. Under Agile, you get a couple of different ones. Under DevOps, you get quite a few more. There's also testing. Again, under Waterfall, typically you'll have a bigger test period that's going to happen once right before the release. With Agile, there's definitely more of an expectation of testing more frequently, and of course, DevOps even more frequently after that. So in reality, the biggest difference between them is that under DevOps, you're deploying a lot more often than you are under Waterfall or Agile. And this is one of the revelations that happened, uh, not this year, but last year at the um, Open Summit. Um, we actually met with um, some great individuals who are in the process of writing, not from the security standpoint, but just purely for software developers, a DevOps model of what DevOps really is. And we actually sat with them for a couple of evenings and we compared everything that is an open SAM and everything that's missing an open SAM against their maturity model. And this was by far our biggest aha moment is that deployment is really the biggest area that's truly different between waterfall, agile, and DevOps. That in DevOps you do it a lot more frequently. So um, any questions about anything that I've said so far? Anyone wants to disagree? Did I say anything that upset anyone? Пройдусь по залу. Запитання є? So, seems like we don't have any questions. Нема запитань. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about SAM 2.0 because let's be honest, that's why we're that's why I'm here. Um, under SAM 2.0, the biggest change we've made that's really, really structural is that we've identified that we really need to implement a new business function that specifically caters to deploy caters to implementation. Because this was by far the most, as I just mentioned, the most powerful difference between um, older development methodologies and some of the newer ones. And so the new model moving forward is going to look like this. Now, as I say this, please bear in mind, I updated these slides last night. Uh, this model, because again, we're trying to leverage DevOps for writing 2.0 and maintaining 2.0, uh, this model is quite literally changing daily um, as we are actively rewriting it. Um, and I'll give you some links after I'm done so that you can kind of watch and monitor that in progress. So this information is current as of yesterday. So first under governance. Now, we didn't make a ton of improvements in this area because the old one did really work. The biggest area that we tried to strengthen in the model is reliance on metrics. So our first security practice is strategy and metrics. And within that, we have two activity streams that are guiding your maturity levels. The first one is to create and promote your strategy and metrics. Now, why is it important? Um, if you are not incorporating your newest and greatest ideas for how to develop software into an overall strategy, the chances are it won't happen. And with metrics, there is an old saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. There was a time when software development and application security enjoyed mystique that was, well, you can't measure what we do. Well, now that's over, and everybody wants to measure everything, and that excuse of what we do is too unique so you can't measure it doesn't work anymore. So there is an expectation that we are going to be measuring and managing pretty much every aspect of our security life cycle. From the policy and compliance standpoint, yes, I understand nobody likes policies, but at the same time, policies is how companies set standards for how the software is going to be developed. Um, 
for those of you who are developers in the room, I'm sure you've had plenty of frustrations where you spend you know months writing a piece of code only to realize that you have to basically redo all of it because whoever asked you to write it didn't consult with the company standards and you couldn't have written it that way. Compliance management is also becoming an ever-increasing source of third-party requirements because while well, compliance requirements are increasing all the time around the world. Um, GDPR has certainly been a great shakeup in Europe. Um, in the United States, there are new privacy and security um, compliance requirements being published all the time. Um, and actually, some of the larger organizations that are more global in nature are starting to publish their own compliance requirements for individual applications. Um, so this is definitely a growing practice. From the education and guidance, uh, this is a particular. This is a one that I'm particularly passionate about because, um, honestly, there's just too many tools out there. There's things are changing very, very quickly, and organizations are not investing in training developers. They're not investing in actually teaching people how to use these tools. Um, very often, when I work with large organizations, I find that there are two teams that somehow got the money to train their developers and. You know, they're very mature, they're using Jenkins, they're using, they got full CI CD pipelines deployed, they're happy, they're doing things the way they want. And then you have a bunch of other teams that quite literally, you know, they, they would love to take advantage of some of those things, but they can't because no one actually gives them time to learn or money to learn it. Um, and so training and awareness um, through SAM 2.0 is going to emphasize developing product expertise and develop security champions and product champions within the organization. So that to eventually make training a lot more accessible and a lot more available across the entire organization. Um, from the organization and culture standpoint, again, this is an area of huge opportunity because I think that the company culture is probably one of the most understated benefits of DevOps. Um, in that with DevOps, programmers take a lot more responsibility for the code they're writing all the way from the original design through the test. And in many organizations, you do so much automated quality control testing before the code is committed that you might not even be able to consider something completed until you go back and you fix all the bugs. And that has fostered a very important cultural shift um, that I think a lot of organizations are really underappreciating. Um, from the design standpoint, um, because there are a lot more applications than ever before now, um, we have to address being able to tell different applications apart and knowing which ones are more important, which ones are less important, which ones are threatened more, which ones are threatened less. Um, it's not uncommon to find large global companies that will have thousands of applications under development. Um, that's not an exaggeration, literally thousands. And so under threat assessment, we're starting to teach organizations, how do you build a risk profile for each application? And how do you make that risk profile make sense? How do you make it that it is inarguable, that it's not focused on one person's opinion, but on values that are important to the overall organization. And connected to that, we're also promoting threat modeling as a way to take those applications that you have identified as particularly important and then focus your security on addressing the actual threats, not just fixing code for the sake of fixing code. Um, I spent seven years working for a pen test company and I've, and I've sat through a lot of meetings where pen testers are delivering hundreds and hundreds of pages of here is all the problems we found. But a lot of those problems aren't actually a problem because they're all sort of compensated for by other things the organization has done. And then when the organization applies some of the threat modeling principles, they're able to focus and fix things that they actually matter. And so again, this is part of what Sam is gonna try to teach organizations how to do better. Um, the other piece from the design is security requirements. Now, again, security application security is unique. And it's uniqueness in that there is a return on investment in improving the maturity of your process. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say you have a firewall. And that firewall has an incorrect configuration that is technically making it weaker. 
you put the assuming breaches haven't happened there haven't been any security incidents you hired a security scanning company they came in they scanned your firewall and they said look you have this problem so you say okay we will create a ticket and you have change management and an admin goes and takes five minutes and types in the right command and fixes the problem. Now, the relative time and cost to fix that problem is roughly the same after the firewall is in production versus before that firewall is in production because it's a very simple change. Now, think about software requirements. If you only do pen testing on the software that has been pushed into production, a pen tester finds a problem. What do you have to do now? Now you have to take it all the way back to the line. You have to figure out how to solve the problem. You have to code the changes. You have to test. You have to test for interoperability with other components. You have to make sure that it doesn't adversely impact any other functionality or anything else. Sometimes that defect might require going all the way back to the user because maybe user functionality needs to be changed somewhat. Um, they have done multiple studies on this. Um, and uh, both, I think, the United States, NIST, and IBM, um, and Panaman Institute, they've all sort of got together and they figured out that it can take as much as 30 times more expensive to fix a defect found post-production than it would to find a defect at the design phase. So clearly, the more organizations can do at this stage within this business function of design, the more security problems could be eliminated so that they never get into production in the first place. And there's some very real return on investment there. So from the security requirement standpoint, we're focused on both security requirements for the organization itself, as well as third-party security requirements, which would encompass vendor requirements or client requirements or compliance requirements, things that are more regulatory in nature. And of course, there's secure architecture. Uh, because you saw that the world of computing architecture is moving so quickly now and you have so many different options, different architectural decisions can actually have a fairly significant role on how easy or difficult it is to secure an application. Um, and again, this one goes from a lot of painful experience many of us have shared where you, know, you have a pen tester who is scanning an application and finding all kinds of holes, but these holes aren't really coding problems, there are more problems with authentication or session management. Um, I worked with one company where they were trying to hand off an authentication session from a uh, cold fusion system into a Java application. And there's just, there's, there's literally no way to make that secure. And so a lot of times focus on secure architecture at the design phase can also help eliminate many security defects from within your code base. Now, implementation, this is our newest one. Um, this one I'm really excited about because, again, this helps address things that are really more in line with how software is being built today. Um, first of all, the build process itself. Um, now, again, uh, for those of you who are newer to this field, you probably haven't seen the pains of getting something to build the same way on your machine as it builds on somebody else's machine, as it builds in the test environment versus production. I mean, just to get the build process to be consistent used to be, and still is for many organizations, a significant challenge. And so through SAM, we want to guide organizations towards standardizing their builds. Um, first, by emphasizing the need to make sure that the builds are fully documented and easy to replicate, and then moving it down the chain all the way through build automation. Now, from the software supply chain standpoint, again, since this is now a whole separate principle, you do need to understand where your modules are coming from. So I would say that if today you're writing a software where part of your build process pulls things from the internet that haven't been previously vetted, that's a problem. And this is something that you're gonna have to address at some point down the line. Um, from the secure deployment standpoint, um, for many years, auditors fought the battle to get developers out of production. Um, and it's not a bad thing to happen. I mean, you want developers to stop playing in production. You want developers to play in the more in development area. So from the security development standpoint, from sorry, excuse me, from security deployment standpoint, your deployment process does become a lot more important. And thanks to a lot of the principles of continuous integration, continuous deployment, 
um, it can actually now be fully automated and get it to a point where a developer initiates the push to production, but a developer doesn't actually need to touch anything after that point. And so that process could be fully automated. Also, because we have so many different components that are interoperating with one another, um, from all the microservices to all the different Docker containers and all the uh, various layers of an application, you do have to think about how these various layers authenticate to one another and how you're going to manage secrets or passwords in this case. So configuration and secret management have become a very significant area of focus for us. And we're offering a lot of guidance that take it anywhere from work towards making sure you're not putting passwords in plain text and takes it all the way through instantiating passwords um, randomly during the deployment process. So quite literally, no one knows what they are. They're being generated and, and injected at the deployment. Um, from the defect management standpoint, again, this is an area of great opportunity from the implementation standpoint, because certainly defect tracking um, has evolved quite a bit. And one of our challenges is to make defect tracking influence some of the steps earlier in a development life cycle. So for example, if you're able to identify a pattern of input validation issues um, or complete mediation issues within your defect tracking, um, perhaps the best way to fix that problem isn't to tackle one defect at a time, but to identify it as a broader problem and take it back to the design phase. Um, and of course, that goes right into the metrics and feedback learning, where um, the maturity path lies anywhere from starting to do it well for a single project or a single application, and all the way back to being able to share metrics and feedback learning um, across different development teams. From the verification standpoint, again, this is the one that, from the application security standpoint, most of us are familiar with, um, but we are changing it a little bit. So first of all, we are including an architecture assessment as part of it. Uh, because of the complexity of the computing infrastructure deployments where you literally have applications now that might span multiple cloud providers, um, it is important to look at not only application architecture, but also the supporting architecture beneath it. Um, how are you building the application? How are you hosting it? What are the weaknesses that may exist behind the scenes? Um, from the requirements standpoint, um, requirements-driven testing all goes back to a lot of things that you can theoretically automate and certainly also use your users to help you with. And here we're splitting them into two categories. Now, control verification in context of requirements-driven testing is something we're very familiar with because this is where you say, well, the requirements said the application is supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And so we need to make sure the application does X, Y, and Z. Something that's quite a bit newer that people are starting to incorporate more and more into their development process is misuse or abuse case testing, where you're saying, well, ideally, this is what's supposed to happen. However, we would like to also automate tests that go completely outside of the realm of possibilities just to see how the application will respond, to make sure that it fails safe, to make sure that it doesn't crash open. Um, and so we're also going to be providing a lot more guidance in how organizations can take more advantage of automated misuse and abuse case testing and make that all part of your CI CD pipeline. From the security testing standpoint, uh, we have a scalable baseline testing, which is kind of what I would call a fully automated assessment tool. So tools like WebInspect, um, I would call that a scalable baseline. We call it scalable baseline because typically these kinds of tools you can cover a lot of applications with fairly inexpensively because the cost of scanning each application through Web WebInspect is actually fairly small. Now, deep understanding, this is a manual penetration test. <clears throat> so this is where you're actually paying an application security expert to go after you and do everything in the book to try to break in. Both certainly have a lot of value to an organization, 
Uh, but obviously, keeping in mind that because manual penetration testing is a lot more expensive than fully automated one, um, you want to leverage both. And you definitely want to leverage both because there are certain things that automated testing simply will never be able to do. For example, you know, easiest example, of course, being automated testing tools don't understand authorization. They just don't. They can test authentication. They can test session, but they don't. I mean, it, it's hard for fully automated tools to think like a person and try to push the envelopes the same way. And so you definitely need both. And we help companies understand what each one looks at different maturity levels and what would the right path be to become a lot more advanced in each of these areas. <clears throat> Um, from the operation standpoint, we also decided to update this area quite a bit um, because, again, from the incident management standpoint, this is becoming a much more important thing because applications are honestly getting security incidents thrown at them all the time. And uh, we want to make sure that organizations prepare for these things ahead of time by both writing applications in a way that allows them to identify when an incident is happening. Uh, maybe it's tracking ex, you know, elevated CPU utilization. Maybe it's tracking abnormal behavior in other sense, like open connections, as well as incident response. And in this case, what we're really talking about is um, getting more prescriptive with various development teams about who is going to be on the response team, what logs are available, um, how would you go around um, creating a team and investigating to determine whether an incident had occurred and what is the extent of the damage. Uh, there have been countless uh, incidents that I've personally been aware of where an organization had a fairly innocent security incident but ended up declaring a breach because they couldn't prove that the incident did not touch sensitive data. Um, from the environment management standpoint, uh, patching and hardening are the two old reliable classics. Now, it has become a lot more difficult to apply some of the traditional methodologies of patch management to environments like Docker. I mean, what's the point of scanning for vulnerabilities a container that's only going to be alive for a week? By the time you're done, by the time you figure out what needs to be done, that container is going to get rebuilt. So patching and hardening needs to change a little bit to better accommodate the new world of computing that we're living in today, where patching is more about identifying latest and greatest um, boxes or images you need to pull in. And also, and this is an area where, again, developers have a lot to learn from the infrastructure people in learning how do you harden various services? What are the things you have to do to a database to harden it against misuse? What do you need to do to a uh, web server to harden it against misuse? Um, and again, here we're going to offer a lot more guidance that caters to both some of the traditional methods for patching and hardening as well as um, newer DevOps models. And from the operational and management standpoint, um, here we're trying to cater to two different areas. First is data management. Uh, because the nature of DevOps, you have data flying everywhere. Um, developers need snippets of data on their machines to be able to build and test. You have many different environments. You have software that kind of goes through build processes in many different areas. And at the same time, privacy requirements are becoming increasingly more of a concern. And so organizations need to do a much better job at creating fully automated ways of taking secure and safe snapshots of production data that get sanitized enough to where they're still useful for your development purposes, but at the same time, they are safe and cannot be used to cause a breach to an organization. Um, and finally, when it comes to system decommissioning and legacy management, uh, there are still a lot of organizations that struggle with sunsetting old systems. And that process is surprisingly chaotic. Um, and so, again, from the SEM standpoint, we wanted to provide guidance for organizations on making sure that they have a process by which they can actually decommission things. So, that's the new structure of SAM 2.0 as of yesterday. 
Now, what do I mean by as of yesterday? Uh, there, in the past, OWASP SAM was published as a PDF, a beautiful PDF, filled with colors and charts and graphs and clever images. The problem was that it literally would take a month for somebody to republish it. I mean, it was a very involved process. Um, we all very strongly felt that it's just not going to work. So instead, we created a new website called OWASPSAM.org. And uh, for those of you that are familiar, we're using Hugo. We're basically using a static site generator uh, that's rebuilding that website fairly within about a two minute delay uh, from any changes that are committed. So we're, we're rewriting DevOps using Markdown <clears throat> and they put some links on for you so you can actually go and check out exactly how it's being done. Um, and something that we would actually love to get the entire community's collaboration on is in helping us make it better. Now, right now, we're doing two-week sprints in generating content. And so you will see some areas, if you go there right now and start browsing, you'll see that um, some areas are very, very empty and other areas are fairly fleshed out. Uh, the reason why is because we're actively going through two-week sprints and generating content. So you're going to see that area... Um, get completely filled out by October. Uh, right now, our goal is to have a miniature uh, SAM Summit in October, where we, by that time, we should have the entire model written, at least enough to have it in draft form. Having said that, as you're looking at it, if you have ideas or thoughts about anything that has been written or anything that we haven't written yet, but you would like to throw some ideas, uh, we would like everyone to create issues using that same GitHub OWASP SAM. Um, to, and, and when you put those comments in and you explain which business function, which security practice those comments are for, um, as we go through our two-week sprints and as we go through our very frequent um, status update meetings, we incorporate all of that feedback into the model. So we really want to make this a much more of a community effort where everyone can contribute and everyone can suggest ideas and everyone can help us write this. Um, and hopefully that will also improve the willingness of the community to um, adopt this model and really make it um, and really use it well for promoting AppSec. So this is the extent of all the information that I've prepared for you. Um, сейчас я с удовольствием отвечу, если есть какие-то вопросы. Огромнейшее спасибо за такой прекрасный доклад. Так, я готов прибежать с микрофоном к тому, у кого есть вопрос. Вопросики? Есть, все, бегу. Вижу за колонной, не вижу, бегу. Да, спасибо за доклад. А, ну, а, в процессе доклада вы много говорили о самом сам, но там еще есть toolbox, который раньше был а, таким Excel файлом. А, сейчас планируется какой-то, не знаю, апдейт? А, спасибо, да, это очень хороший вопрос. А, самый короткий ответ, да, конечно. А, то есть мы, но... Настолько, насколько нам всем понравился этот спредчет, когда он был сделан, его дописал человек Брайан Глаз. Этот спредчет действительно помог многим как-то понять имплементацию этой системы. Но в то же самое время одна из проблем – это то, что эту, эту модель тяжело применять к организации, в которой 20 программ разработки. И приходилось или обобщать процедуры между разными, то есть практики между разными программами, или урезать а, эффективность этой модели. И сейчас, что мы планируем, это мы планируем выпустить Toolbox, но сделать ее более как а, node-based application и дать людям возможность иметь немножко больше а, возможностей с этой моделью, чтобы не только там одну программу прогнать через этот процесс, 
а, но также прогнать несколько компаний через этот процесс. А, также а, моя новая фирма, которую я организовал, называется Truanix. А, мы сейчас разрабатываем программу, которая будет, конечно, построена более для огромных корпораций, чтобы они могли лучше использовать а, SAM-модель. И также я сейчас планирую выпустить а, ограниченную модель этой программы в open source, Опять, чтобы людям дать возможность легче применять эту модель для своих работ. Поэтому я, может быть, в какой-то короткий период времени это будет очередной спредшит, но сейчас, по крайней мере, наши планы себя включают что-то намного более интересное. Спасибо за ответ. Еще есть вопросы? Да, есть вопрос, бегу. Спасибо за доклад. Во время имплементации возникает иногда ощущение у компании, которая пытается на свои процессы натянуть сам. Не то чтобы критика, но вопрос, нельзя ли в некоторых местах больше сделать упора на низкий уровень имплементации. Потому что в, том, в, том, в тех частях, в которых речь идет о скажем так, более технологических вопросах и можно сделать отсылки на тестинг гайд, на СВС, на другие проекты у вас, по с этим сложности не возникает. Но когда речь идет, допустим, об обучении, целостной программы этого самого обучения особо-то и нету. Да? И стоит цель, проведите для сотрудников департаментов разработки, application security awareness training. И тут вот насколько security чемпион в компании или внешний консультант, в общем-то, опытные в этой области, вот настолько они вольны выбирать источники информации. Есть ли какие-то планы вот в таких high-level областях сделать э, более такой сфокусированный гайденс во второй версии? А, спасибо за вопрос. А, это не только, у нас не только на это есть планы, мы так сейчас, в принципе, это и пишем. То есть, если, а, если вы посмотрите на модель, на те страницы, которые уже более или менее заполнены, вы увидите, что мы сейчас намного больше внедряем, вместо того, чтобы пытаться поставить какие-то более постоянные ресурсы, мы сейчас ставим намного больше hyperlinks на различные проекты и OWASP, и вне OWASP, которые могут помогать людям, как это все правильно делать. И в принципе сейчас мы концентрируемся на, намного больше на prescriptive guidance, то есть именно не просто сказать, окей, ты должен эту программу внедрить, а именно объяснить, как это лучше сделать, каким образом нужно задействовать людей, а, где можно достать информацию для этой программы. А, то есть, безусловно, это одно из направлений, куда мы идем. Сложность — это в том, что иногда тяжело определить, когда мы, прови... когда мы даем информацию, которая никому не нужна. То есть, к примеру, если, к примеру, если я задумался бы, я бы сказал, что ну, я не знаю, насколько людям непонятно, как создать security awareness training. Но для кого-то другого, для них это большая проблема. То есть это как раз та ситуация, где если у вас есть опыт работы с этой моделью, и есть определенные точки, где а, вы сталкивались с такого рода проблемами, а, пожалуйста, пойдите, создайте нам issues через GitHub, и дайте нам знать, что вот это вот отделы, где вы бы хотели увидеть больше информации. И это нашей группе поможет более сконцентрироваться и предоставить эту информацию. Ну и в принципе, опять же, как понятно, что это одна из причин, почему мы хотим эту модель изменить в ключевом образе и делать ее более а, по принципу CICD. Потому что когда такие вопросы возникают, в старой модели, ну, можно задать вопросы, кто-то на него ответит. А здесь мы можем именно взять все эти вопросы и внедрить их в модель в течение дня. И тогда сразу все остальные видят эту информацию. Спасибо, вопросы. Так, все остальное ясно, понятно. Вообще сам он такой крутой, берешь и делаешь. А плюс еще нам за целый час рассказали все-все-все вопросы, которые у нас с ним возникали. Теперь у нас есть ответы. Давайте... Um, я планирую быть в Киеве uh, где-то, надеюсь, в августе. 
Так что, когда я буду в Киеве, с удовольствием, если есть желание, встретился бы. А с людьми можно больше в деталях обговорить. Я могу больше показать про эту модель. Спасибо большое. Давайте еще раз поблагодарим. Спасибо. Спасибо.